So um, I do really believe that we are in a wonderful season. Uh, we, as many parishes, a couple of years ago, we asked you, you know, do you really want to grow or do you want to go quietly into the night? And uh, overwhelmingly, parishes said we actually want to work towards growing. We want to change and do what it takes to grow. And we actually are seeing those changes ripple through. We're not saying every parish in this room is growing, but we are saying a whole lot more parishes are growing now than they were five years ago. You know, and, and we are seeing right across the diocese parishes really grappling with how to change. And, and I know, uh, because I'm part of many, many conversations where it is very um, challenging. But parishes are, are kind of steering that challenge straight on and actually embracing that challenge. So I just want to say, um, in that sense, you know, uh, I stand here so full of gratitude for what God is doing amongst us and for what, uh, in some senses, your, what God is doing in your life and your individual parishes. I had a picture which was um, in May, uh, Ellie and myself and, and Jenny, we... We were lucky enough to represent us at a conference in New York, and it was amazing and kind of once in a lifetime, and I felt incredibly blessed to have been there. But near the end of the time, uh, me and Jenny, uh, we sneaked off to explore New York, and um, Nigel Dixon, who's not with us today, and just so you know, Nigel's um, father is, is passing away, and so we should hold him in our prayers and his whanau in our, his prayers at this time. But Nigel had given me, uh, in true Nigel Dixon style, he said, if the one thing you do in New York is you've got to go to a jazz club. And I said to Nigel, because Nigel's you know, a connoisseur of all, that, all those things, uh, and I said, so Nigel, give me, a, give me a list of the top you know, two or three jazz clubs that we've got to visit in New York. And so Nigel uh, dutifully sent me through this list of jazz clubs. Now, this is confession, and I'm sorry here, but then I started Googling the jazz clubs, and you know, they were just so expensive. And I'm just kind of, you know, one of those people who just sort of think, well, I really appreciate it that much. And, that much. and so, so I was kind of, I realised I'd made this commitment to Nigel, but I, I really kind of couldn't kind of get myself to go into a flash jazz club in New York. So me and Jenny went on a walking tour of Harlem. And on this walking tour of Harlem, um, this, the woman, the local woman who was doing the tour, she said, oh, there's a cafe over there that has jazz music that you can just go to any time. So, so we came back there to Harlem to go to this jazz cafe. And just so you want to know, uh, if you ever want to go there, it's 449 Malcolm X Boulevard. So it even sounds like Harlem, see? Just so you know. So we turned up at this jazz club, jazz cafe, and it was just this most amazing experience because there was um, a five-piece five jazz band uh, just local people, the bass player was 93 years old. <laughs> it was phenomenal. And, um, and it was a very small place, very, very small venue. And then um, the local preschool, uh, who I think the owner of the cafe was her granddaughter, their local preschool had turned up during the day to be part of this, this jazz cafe. So there's all, there's all these kids running around everywhere. And it was also true, you, it was, what made experience really good is there was a sangria served, um, that was good, and there was a hint of marijuana, which I make you sure that I did not inhale at all. <laughs> okay. Uh, but there was this amazing afternoon of jazz music, and there was very few of us in this cafe, actually, very few, and the, the jazz band they would, um, they, after a while, they, they passed out the instruments to the, to the preschoolers. It was just phenomenal. And then um, they, would, they then gave one of the preschoolers the microphone and they did a preschool song and the jazz musicians kind of did their thing behind it. It was just incredibly beautiful. And then there was this moment where the kind of the, uh, the drummer yelled, you know, leaned over to, um, to one of the preschoolers and said, when you get home, you tell your ma that you're a member of a jazz band. <laughs> it was just kind of like, it was absolutely beautiful, eh? It was just so beautiful. And then um, some people came in off the street and just were kind of in this vibe, you know, randoms came in and were part of this kind of crazy vibe of this little cafe in the back, you know, just on 449 Malcolm X Boulevard. And... Um, 
And then the owner, the owner made this quote, which I just said this to us, and I, I wrote it down because it was so good. When you are travelling, but she found out we were from New Zealand, she said, when you are travelling and you hit something authentic, it really matters. When you are travelling and you hit something authentic, it really matters. And for me, God spoke about our life together in that experience because it kind of gave me a picture of what we're meant to be. We're meant to be the local jazz bar. You know, we're not the flash one where you pay 50 bucks at the door, you know, and, and people flock from all around. We're your local jazz bar. And every, every suburb should have its local jazz bar. And they should have the people doing that crazy improvisation of music, which kind of is recognisable and it's, imp it's improvisation at the same time. And it should be that generosity where the generations gather. And actually the, 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 the experts are happy to make the, the four-year-olds look good. You know what I mean? And, there's that, and, and, and what we're known for and why people will come in, because when people are travellers and they're looking for something, they love the authenticity of our life together. And so for me, I think that's a picture of who we're called to be. We're called to be that crazy jazz cafe with a 93-year-old playing bass, but then the four-year-old leading the song. And together, we're making this beautiful music and maybe not the marijuana. So as I give you that picture of our journey together, um, God also, I think, sort of led me earlier this year to a passage for us, and it was that passage uh, in Numbers 13, and I'll read it to you, but you'll know it well, and I won't read the whole, but I'll... It's um, the Israelites sending out the spies into the Promised Land. When Moses sent them to explore Canaan, he said, Go up through the Nigev and on into the hill country. See what the land is like and whether the people who live there are strong or weak, few or many. What kind of land do they live in? Is it good or bad? What kind of towns do they live in? Are they unwalled or fortified? How is the soil? Is it fertile or poor? Are there trees in it or not? Do your be best to bring back some of the fruit of the land. It was a season for the first ripe grapes. So they went up and explored the land from the desert of Zin as far as Rehob towards Lebob and Hamath. They went up through the Negev and came to Hebron where, I should have got Caleb to read this, why I set myself up so badly? <laughs> what was I thinking? Where... Um, where they came to the land where Oakuni, then to uh, Ratahi, and then to Fielding, and then to Shannon, and the, the descendants were there. The descendants of Anak lived. When they reached the Stokes Valley, they then cut off a branch bearing a single cluster of grapes. Two of them carried it on a pole between them, along with some pomegranates and figs. That place was called the Valley of Ishkol because of the cluster of grapes the Israelites cut off there. And at the end of 40 days, they returned from exploring the land. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you have sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalites live there in the, in the, Jiv, the Hittites, the Jebuites, the Amorites live in hill countries, the Canaanites live near the sea, and the Catholics along the Jordan. No, I made that up, sorry. <laughs> then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. And for those of you who know the rest of the story, um, they don't. When courage was called for, the people didn't take the land. And I really felt like that was a message for us. Uh, me and Ellie uh, have been reflecting. She came back with a fact that I think we knew was true, but now we have it as a fact. Um, here's the fact. New Zealand is the most secular city in the world. Wellington. Wellington. What did I say? 
New Zealand, Wellington. Wellington is the most secular city in the world. So, there are, so percentagely, there are more people of no faith than anywhere else in the world. It's the promised land. <laughs> you know, I love it. I love it. The, the land is full of milk and honey. This place is so ripe for the gospel. Who wouldn't want to be in this place where we have the richest land before us? But the question is, do we have the courage? And I really believe that right across our diocese, God is moving. And I can show you, we've talked about all sorts of stories before. But will you push into that? And will our parishes continue pushing into that? Or will you be afraid and back off? I personally think it's so exciting. God has called us to minister in the most secular place in the world. Wow. I get out of bed in the morning, I jump out of bed going, thank you, Jesus, for this one. <laughs> you know, this is so much better than Auckland, so much better than Christchurch, <laughs> so much better than London. Every city of the world, we're the most secular, and we get to be called to the promised land of milk and honey. And there are giants there, and bring them on, people. Bring them on. We've got you. My heart leaps. But can I say, can we be those people of courage? That's all that's kind of we've got to do is be courageous and continue following it, what God is doing amongst us. Because God is turning up time and time again. We've just got to match that courage. And it goes back to that original, uh, going back to that story. Remember when I was discerning whether I'd, uh, I'd be silly enough to allow my name to go forward to be bishop. I went up the top of um, Kapa Kapa Nui behind uh, Ngāti Awa in the Reikorangi Valley and I was up there, if you remember the story, and I went up there and tented on top of the, the mountain there. And as I was up there, the wind came in, it was a storm and all this sort of stuff like this. And I'm thinking, I'm just going to die up here. Uh, I'm not, you know, I don't even care anymore about a word from the Lord. I'm just here about surviving the night, etc. And um, And it was really interesting. I didn't get, you know, should you be, you know, should you allow your name to go forward or not go forward? Um, this is what God said. In the middle of the night, God said to me, he said, uh, as we're trying to survive the storm, and I'm just thinking how to get my gear, my shoes on fast enough to get to the bush cover to survive the night if need be in an emergency. God said, my faithfulness is not in doubt. The question is, do you have the courage? And I think that resounds through the years for me, as God, will, God has always been his covenantal faithfulness to us. God is always desiring to, to grow our parishes, to grow our youth ministries, to grow our diocese. The question is, do we have the courage to take the land? So as you reflect on that, I'm going to ask you some questions in a moment. The last thing I felt like um, God asked me in preparation for this, um, and it's in one of those kind of serendipitous things where it's been confirmed in numerous ways, including con conversations with Bishop early, is I'm just aware, like for me, um, I'm really excited about the future, as you can tell. Um, I love it. But I'm also aware, kind of for me, I've been in this role seven years, and we've been on a journey for seven years, uh, in many senses, uh, in the wilderness. And in seven years, uh, you know, we're in, we're in a time of uh, change, but we're also in a time um, where uh, we, are, we are struggling, you know. And when you're, when you're in times of change and when you're in times of struggle, then you know, the relationships between us get tested more and more. And I just felt like God invited me to say, look, you've, you've done seven years, but you know, after seven years, there's a lot of stuff that you will be carrying with your people. And a real sense that for me, uh, in a moment, I'm going to pray a prayer of confession, for, because for me, there's seven years of tense meetings as we wrestle with change and there's seven years of having to have difficult conversations where sometimes I landed it and sometimes I didn't land it well you know what I mean and in those seven years what can build up between me and you is we can have the residue of seven years of of, of a clumsy bishop not always getting it right you know what I mean and we can have all those type of things. So I just feel like God invite, has invited me to, to just confess to you and say, look, I want to walk lightly into the future. So if there's anything between us, anything that, that I've done, anything that I didn't do my best on, I just want to kind of say, hey, you know, I'm sorry. And let's go forward together.
that makes sense? And it's interesting, I, I, I feel like God asked me this quite a while ago, and that was even before that next year's Lenten study is on repentance, which um, Joe McGarry and his crew uh, are putting together for us, which I'm really excited about. And then I know that Ali's had got some reflections on repentance as well. And so I really feel like it's an, uh, you know, it's an invite, you know, for me personally, but for us too. But so I'm just going to, I'm going to take responsibility for what I feel like God's inviting me to do now to finish. And then I'm going to put some questions before you. But, but for me, it's not that there's any dark secrets in the closet, but it's about actually just wanting to be right together for this next season. Because, you know, seven years... There's always things that you could think, oh, should have said that more diplomatically. Maybe should have said when I didn't say anything. You know, all those kind of things. So if you allow me the pleasure and the privilege. Merciful God, I have sinned in what I have thought and said, in the wrong I have done, and in the good I have not done. I have sinned in ignorance, I have sinned in weakness. I have sinned through my own deliberate fault. I am truly sorry. I repent and turn to you. Forgive me for our Saviour Christ's sake and renew my life to the glory of your name. Amen. Bishop Justin, God forgives you, forgive others, and forgive yourself. Know that through Christ, God has put away your sin and approach your God in peace. And to find out to cry to you, brothers and sisters in Christ, as Jesus taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For your kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Amen. Just to finish now, reflecting on the story of um, from Numbers 13, and I'm going to ask you three questions, and I'd love it for you to discuss them in your parish or your table groups, and you can discuss them in two levels. You can talk about it from what this means to your personal life and what it means for your parish or mission unit life. I'll read out the questions, and then I might get somebody to type them up on a screen. So I'll read them out and then we'll get them put up on the screen. So first one is, where do you see the first fruit of the kingdom? Where do you see the first fruit of the kingdom? So you can answer that personally in your life or in your ministry unit. Second, where do you experience giants in the land? Where do you experience giants in the land? And third question is, what unique courage is God calling you to? you being single or parish, your mission unit. So I'll get them typed up. Where do you see first fruit of the kingdom? Where do you experience giants in the land? And what unique courage is God calling your, you or your parish to? And we're going to give you uh, maybe, maybe about 15 minutes to have conversations at your table, locate those things, and then it will be lovely if you pray with each other into your answers. Thanks.